Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're again joined by Dr. Monica Young. We had her a couple podcasts ago where she was talking with us about the IMI and the research that they're doing. This particular podcast is really cool because she's talking about uh, what some of this research is and how new treatments are being looked at for dry eye, things I had never even heard of internationally as far as treatments that maybe in the future we'll see come available. I wanted to bring up that at the time of the recording, uh, she was involved with the IMI. She had not yet taken her role as the Global Director of Professional Education and Myopia at Johnson & Johnson. So she's speaking as behalf of or on behalf of the, ex uh, as being the Executive Director of the IMI and not yet in her role at JNJ. &J. I hope this is intriguing to you as it was to me. And uh, thank you, Dr. Young, for your participation on the podcast. And we look forward to uh, future educational endeavors uh, that are going to be coming from you as part of uh, your role at Johnson & Johnson. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you again for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Again, uh, on this episode, we have Dr. Monica Young uh, from the International Myopia Institute. She's the executive director, and she has uh, led the way on uh, a lot of the great work that has been done for the 2019 and the 2020 white papers which summarize a lot of the research that's out there. So Monica's had this uh, great opportunity as the executive director to be part of all this incredible research that has come through. And I thought it would be a great opportunity for us to pick her brain and figure out uh, all the things that we wanna know, or at least that I wanna know about what has been happening and what is going to be happening. So thank you for joining us, Monica, for this episode. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Yes, yes. So, uh, Monica, one of the things I want to start off with is a little bit of uh, information about why myopia is a problem. I, 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 most of our listeners, you know, are already in the myopia management world, but just help cement into my mind, into their minds, uh, of why myopia is not just a nuisance of a refractive career, of a refractive error, refractive correction but why we're thinking about myopia as a disease now. Yeah, I think this is a concept that we need to really address and change the viewpoints globally. Um, you know, firstly, within the eye care practitioner community, it's not common knowledge that myopia is an ocular condition. And if it's not common knowledge within the eye care practitioner community, then it's not, it's definitely not going to be common knowledge with the general um general patient base. Right. So what we're seeing around the world is myopia increasing significantly, mainly in East Asia now. But even within the US, Susan Vitali reported that myopia prevalence also almost doubled within mm -hmm. a 30-year period. And so North America is also in the midst of this uh, significant increase in myopia, and that's not normal. No. But we've been conditioned to think it's normal because eye care practitioners have been doing such a great job of correcting vision to the point where people don't see the difference with, you know, when they have their glasses on, they're functionally like everybody else. With any other condition, you know, if you have a walking stick or, or you know, you need to have a knee replacement or have some yeah. other thing added to you, that's not, you're still considered you know, that you've got a health issue. But with myopia, it hasn't been considered like that. But the new evidence that's coming out is showing that with uh, the increasing prevalence of myopia, it's going to hit 50% uh, of the world by 2050 by the work that we did in our team at BHVI. You know, there's also going to be an increase in the number of complications. And, you know, those complications include um, primary open angle glaucoma, uh, posterior subcapsular cataracts, and then really serious things like retinal detachment, as well yeah. as myopic macular degeneration. Yeah. Those, those risks increase exponentially once you hit the higher levels of myopia. But even yeah. at the lower levels of myopia, you can still get them. And so with more people developing it, these conditions we're going to see a lot more of. And they also happen in a younger age. So once you hit 40 plus and you've got higher levels of myopia, you're more likely to get it. And, and we're seeing the evidence that's showing that 
with increased axial length, this is kind of what is causing these ocular issues, the stretching of the eyeball that's affecting all the ocular structures within the eye. Yeah. So it is very serious because mm -hmm. we may not be seeing all these problems now, but imagine, you know, your high myope or low myope going for cataract surgery and the cataract surgery will correct for the cataract, but because they have all these risk factors, even going for cataract surgery can actually increase the risk of developing the retinal issues due to the myopia. So, yeah. you know, it, it's something that we need to change our concept. It's not a refractive condition. It's an ocular issue and it's worthy of addressing as early as possible, either prevent it, but in our case, we have to slow it in everyone that has myopia clinically. Monica, uh, you did your PhD in retinal structure. And uh, I mean, who better to have somebody leading the Myopia Institute uh, than somebody who, you know, knows so much about retinal structure. I don't, I don't know that it fully caught on to my mind about high myopia and the effect of it until somebody asked me, go and look at your patients who have retinal disease and then look back at their refractive error and see how often that is. Do we have data that is out there on the number of individuals that have retinal pathology and then tie it back to their myopia? I know we, you know, oftentimes think about the number of myopes and their pathology, but is there a strong correlation there? And from the work that you did in your PhD, did you guys pick up on that? Well, my PhD wasn't exactly in myopia. Mine was in retinitis pigmentosa. Okay. So I was looking at retinal structure and functioning that. But we also had people with high levels of myopia in the RP patients. So for us at the time, you know, some of the changes we're seeing, the bone spickle pigmentation, et cetera, that was the RP. But sure. then then the high myopia changes we're seeing, such as the, you know, the 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 significant papillary atrophy, the mm -hmm. posterior staphylomas. And so we see this reflected in studies today done by Professor Ming Guanghe from um, China, as well China. as Professor Kyoko Onomatsui from Japan, you know, where they've looked and followed high myopes and pathologic high myopes and see who actually developed all these pathologies. And they're saying, you know, at least probably up to even 50% develop some form of uh, retinal changes over time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. quite a significant number develop some kind of myopic maculopathy. Yeah. So yeah. they are correlating that. And then we, we also have seen studies published by, you know, retinal surgeons who might've done, um, you know, oh, sorry. Uh, they might've done cataract surgeries. Yeah. Uh, Cataract surgeons done cataract surgery and followed up patients and seen how many of the high myopes developed attachments afterwards. So, you yeah. know, you, retrospectively, we can see that high myopes have more risk of developing ocular issues that lead to vision impairment and blindness down the track. They yeah. may not develop it at the time of the surgery, but later on, you know, a decade down. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a, a quick evaluation that I did is that 100% of my patients go on that go on to become 60 and 70 years old started off as five, six, and seven years old. I mean, I don't know if that has any scientific backing, but I think that 100% of people who are 60, 70 years old started off at five, six, and seven. And we know that if you develop myopia before, uh, you know, six or seven years of age, you're a, a six or seven times greater likelihood of developing high myopia. So this concept of intervention early on is just so key for us. And I think that that is, is really that breaking point is like, I'm not seeing the diseased aspect of myopia. Now I'm just seeing the refractive error. How do we how do we start making this change in the mindsets of and I know from the IMI you, you guys are doing that work and trying to work with you know governing bodies and so forth to bring about this but how do we change this mindset in eye care providers worldwide? Yeah, I mean we started off in the defining and classifying myopia white paper published in 2019 by setting a recommended definition. So this is an early definition that we're using. So these definitions may change over time depending on, you know, the need. Um, so pre myopia we considered a refractive state of the eye where a child who who may be now between plus 0.75 diopters to minus 0.5 diopters based on their young age. Um, their hyperopia may be decreasing with time. They may be um, living a very myopogenic lifestyle, such as a lot of near work, uh, reduced outdoors. Mm -hmm. They have 
uh, myopic parents or myopic siblings, and they might be very nerdy and academic as well. So all these <laughs> like factors their parents, together. right? Yeah, like exactly. their parents. So yeah. if you know if they're young and they're already reducing in hyperopia and they've got these other risk factors, and they may not be myopic today, but they're seven or eight years old and they're only plus 0.5, uh, you know, you can pretty much predict that they are going to become myopic. And yeah. these kids are worthy now of lifestyle counselling, advising them that we prescribe 120 minutes per day outside with sun protection. We recommend you follow the 2020 rule. Um, every 20 minutes, look 20 feet away for about 20 seconds and then review them regularly. And then when they actually are clinically myopic, then you can start myopia management. Having this pre-myopia definition is very powerful because already there are clinical trials underway where they're looking at, you know, low-dose atropine in pre-myopes. Yeah. And, and I dare say eventually at some point they're going to do pre-myopia studies with spectacle, uh, myopia control spectacle lenses. Um, because if a treatment isn't going to have any adverse effects, it's not going to, you know, lead to reduced vision or amblyopia, but it's going yeah. to actually prevent someone from going myopic or prevent that person eventually developing hymopia, then, you know, it's about preventative health and that's yeah. very powerful. So a seven-year-old who's developing myopia today is most definitely going to become a hymope by their late teens or early adulthood if you do nothing, just because we know on average that at a younger age, kids progress faster. So they're progressing, you know, even minus 0.5 to even minus one after a year at those very young ages. And that's what we don't want to see. Right. Right. So when, when uh, Tommy is, uh, you know, 10 years old and he is uh, a minus three and Billy is seven years old and he's a minus 150. And then uh, Jeannie is uh, five years old and she's a plus a quarter. Maybe we should, could, you know, and this is depending on the family and the discussions, maybe we could start putting a drop of atropine in, you know, Jeannie's eyes because she, you know, we've got this family history, we've got this lifestyle and then having discussions about this pre-myopia component. I think the, that that is a future that we may see happening, you know, in the world and see if there's additional things that could come about. Um, you know, there's the, the research that's come out. That's the, the risk factor of treatment compared to the risk factor of not treating um, that, that evidence is purely, clearly shown that, you know, it's far safer for us to treat these, uh, these children than to wait. Um, do you, do you see that evidence really kind of building for us? Yeah, I think in future, when, when we have the studies to support pre myopia treatment, right. that there's no adverse effects, and that's actually the benefits are going to outweigh the risks that will, yeah. that will eventuate, especially with treatment options that don't involve any kind of drug use. And it's, sure. it's totally non-invasive. Yeah, I think people will be up uh, uh, patients will be more receptive to that, yeah. um, knowing that by wearing this treatment option that they're not going to end up, um, you know, having worse and worse vision. That's one way to put it for them. Because yeah. ultimately the patient, the parents don't want to see their kids constantly increasing the thickness of their spectacle lens. Right. They want their kids to have a good quality of life. And, and even from my own personal perspective, you know, I was one of those kids who developed myopia when I was about nine years of age. And, and it's like every time I went to the optometrist, it was just I was I felt down because I kept yeah. on getting thicker and thicker glasses. And, you know, like my family didn't have that much money either, but they always would spend the money to update my glasses because they felt that it was important for me to see. And I think when parents realise the health benefits as well as the quality of life benefits for your kids, um, not being so myopic. Yeah. You know, my peer management is definitely going to become the standard of care. Yeah. And if everyone is offering it um, and speaking the same language about my peer's ocular health issue, that there's these evidence based interventions that work, mm -hmm. um, you know, it'll really help the whole profession move forward. Sure. And now we have new medical devices that allow us to even present the information. Uh, graphically to our patients. So, you know, they have uh, axial length devices which have um, graphs so they can track your patients in real time against mm -hmm. the average and then compare it against an intervention. So you can show your patient where they're tracking 
where they would be with or without treatment. So all those things really help the yes. practitioner in the communication. And actually communication is one of the difficulties and requires, you know, the practitioner to really uh, have all the materials on hand, practice what they're going to say and present it. Yes. And I think that's another area that we we all need to work together and help. Yeah, I think so too. Monica, The in the United States, we don't have uh, spectacles approved for uh, treatment of myopia. Can you, um, can you share with us more information about spectacle lenses worldwide that are being used for myopia? Um, we've got some two, three year data on, on uh, some lenses that are available internationally that are showing some effectiveness. Can you kind of fill us in a little bit? And um, it, it, I, you don't need to be product specific, but you are welcome to be if you, yeah. uh, if you want to mention them. Um, we're not advertising for anybody and they're not yeah. even available in the United States, so it wouldn't matter. Yeah, so traditionally there's only, there has been a real uh, scarcity of spectacle interventions mm -hmm. and that was a real issue because in most part of parts of the world, uh, you know, it, it's dependent on pricing and and the culture, a lot of parts of the world, they parents and grandparents are worried about contact lenses in kids' eyes because there's yeah. been some history of, you know, microbial keratitis. And so, mm -hmm. you know, in those places, they only ever had progressive edition lenses. And, and we know that they're clinically not performing as well as what we have access to now in those parts right. of the world. And then the executive bifocal study showed that they were quite effective, you know, even slowing up to 50% in some kid, North American um, Asian kids. Uh, so they've, they've been taking off as well in Asia. And then they had the peripheral hyperopia reduction lens, um, also known as myovision, that was available. So that was all that was available. And their ability to slow was limited mm -hmm. um, to slow myopia progression. But recently, just in the past uh, two or three years, there's been studies done yeah. on the highly spherical lenslets and the defocus incorporated multiple segments. So they are based on the are reducing uh, the relative peripheral hyperopia by providing myopic defocus. So bringing the retinal image peripherally in front of the retina. So they have all these multiple spots of myopic defocus in the peripheral part of the lens. And the three-year studies are showing that those two lenses um, made by two different companies, um, independently trialled, randomised controlled trial studies done in China and probably now um, other sites in the world, uh, they reported that they're getting, you know, even 50 to 60% on average slowing in myopia progression mm -hmm. in the spherical equivalent refractive rate as well as the axial length. So they're performing just as well as ortho K and probably low, low dose atropine. Um, and so now these lenses are slowly being released in certain markets. So in, in China, Singapore, Malaysia, you can get them. In Australia, some locations can receive them yep. too. Canada, uh, starting, we have them yeah. in Canada. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and they're in rolling Europe. them out mm -hmm. in South America as well as in Europe. And, and even though the price tag uh, is probably a lot more expensive than single vision. Yeah. Um, um, so the randomized controlled trials show that they're effective. Speaking to practitioners, they're saying that the the patients are actually able to um, function very well with these lenses and see properly and they're not needing to have updates and script prescriptions as often as, say, if they wore a single vision lens. So anecdotally, there's good reports about it. So that gives a lot of hope because for a lot of these uh, regions, price is an issue. And so, you know, spectacles have less replacement and they're convenient. So it really works. So it depends yeah. on the region and the demographics. And hopefully yeah. you guys will get them in, in the States. Soon. I think we'll probably have them in the next 12 to 24 months, certainly, maybe even sooner. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and these these options are going to completely revolutionize, uh, you know, countries who don't currently have any spectacle lenses. They'll change the way that all practitioners are thinking about myopia and, you know, present an option to, to us to start presenting to our patients, whether they move forward or not. And, you know, even, even this week I had a patient in here and he needs myopia management, but he's uh, uh, you know, he's, he's 
he's got some behavioral issues and he's not going to be putting a contact lens in his eye and getting his mother to put an eye drop in his eye has not been effective. And, you know, it was just one of those scenarios where he keeps his glasses on and it just got me thinking about this is the perfect kid for this particular scenario. And, uh, you know, so for those of us in the United States and in, in North America that are, are listening, it's certainly something we want to be considered. Now, Monica, you had shared with me in our last podcast a little bit about some things for the future, some studies that have been kind of looming and maybe on the horizon on the pharmaceutical side of things. We're going to start having children drink three cups of caffeine in the morning, and that's going to slow their myopia or something like that. Can you bring clarity to eye drops for myopia management outside of atrophy? Yeah, so... We recognize that myopia is an a, a ocular issue and that there's going to be different interventions that work. And there's also a lot of different patient risk factors and patients can respond, um, you know, slightly differently as we can see even with interventions. And so ultimately all these interventions or treatments, even drug options, slow myopia progression down, but they might just operate on different, you know, receptors. And so It just means that over time, you know, we've got to keep exploring these new avenues. And so the the whole drug aspect is another big area. And that's because, you know, with atropine, we know with some concentrations, there's adverse effects. So pupil dilation, loss of accommodation. Um, And so if you can also find another pharmacologic treatment that slows myopia progression as much as low-dose atropine without the side effects, Mm -hmm that that could be another winner yes and practitioners may be more open to that as well as the the child themselves because yeah. the child doesn't want to have photophobia or mm-hmm. all those other issues so that's why um you know there's different groups looking at things like dopamine eye drops yeah so we know dopamine has been traditionally used as a parkinson's drug yeah. to stop the tremor and things like that there's yeah. a group that's testing the safety of dopamine eye drops Um, because we know that with really bright light levels outside that actually increases the dopamine release in, in, um, animal models. And the dopamine is, has been shown to be something that actually slows eye growth in chicks. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect. And then the caffeine treatment, um, eye drops arose because, you know, in Denmark, they, they've been using seven methylxanthine oral tablets for over a decade. And that's, been led by Dr. Klaus Trier, who's a pediatric ophthalmologist there. He got approval for those uh, oral drugs. So they've been taking like two tablets every day, you know, up to 10 years in some of those kids. And And they're highly functional and very excited about the day. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's what he tells me. But um, 7-methylxanthine is a metabolite of caffeine, so the end stage. And, And so, well, instead of taking something orally, why don't we take a metabolite? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Or take the caffeine as an eye drop because the eye is a closed space. We occlude the puncta. It doesn't get into the systemic system and make our kids all hyperactive. Um, so that study was done in a primate model, which showed that it actually inhibited myopia progression in some mm-hmm. of the monkeys. Mm-hmm. And so now that's undergoing safety studies. And then Christine Wildersett's lab at Berkeley has been right. looking at bromonidine, the yeah. IOP lowering drug, as well as other beta blockers and things like that. And their theory is because, you know, IOP lowering drugs, they they might maybe they're also also acting on the receptors for eye growth, but maybe at the same time it reduces the pressure in the eye and the stretching, and that could be another avenue. So they're new new drugs that they're experimenting on in animals, and maybe we'll go to safety trials. So you know we can look forward to a lot of a lot more options down the track. Um, And then, you know, there's still a lot of groups looking at low-dose atropine in different populations because we don't know um, how Europeans or or white people react to uh, low-dose atropine because most of the studies have been done in East Asian children with highly pigmented irises and they um, they bind the atropine, you know, differently. So, yeah, that's the drug aspect. And then we have a lot more groups looking at optical interventions, you know, different designs. Can they improve the slowing of myopia progression? You know, different ortho-K designs, personalised medicine, for example. 
So I think it's going to be a very exciting future with a lot more um, advances in technology and understanding. And then we have the medical devices that are coming along to support the practitioners, allowing us to better follow up myopia progression using axial length as a, as a risk measurement of uh, how well we're treating and the risk of a, a child going to high myopia. Yeah, yeah. Well, what uh, is is there anything that is, is is just blown your mind when you've read through research that is exciting, or either on diagnostic, or on the con- the disease itself, or on treatments? Is there anything that that just has really been baffling you and and, and excited you uh, as you've read through all the exciting research? Yeah, it's really hard to pick because there's always yeah. really exciting things to read. And I think the most exciting thing was just seeing that there's so many new possibilities and treatment options that practitioners are going to have access to because basically a patient will be able to come to you and you'll address all their needs and be able to be able to look after them for life. Um, other areas that I think are really exciting are the fact that we're going to be really us as ECPs, we are really going to be about holistic health. And that's because, you know, there are groups developing devices that are going to monitor light levels. So you'll get real-time information um, to your practice about the child's exposure to the amount of light or intensity of light, how much new work they're doing. Um, Parents can get that information too. You know, they can actually today buy those apps and it yeah. sends that information to them. So they can monitor their children in real time and tell them, get off the TV, get off the phone um, <laughs> and change their posture because we know all these things are risk factors for developing myopia. Uh, so there's, you know, uh, there's a FitSight device, which is a watch that monitors light levels. Um, there's a clip on, on a frame that also monitors light level and posture and distance. So I think there's, there's just going to be so many possibilities in the future yeah. about what our scope of practice is. So it's really opening our scope of practice and making us even more important in, um, you know, looking after our patient's health. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode. It's uh, been really great to hear your perspectives on things and uh, thank you for what you're doing with the IMI to bring all this awareness to us. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much for your time. And it was a real pleasure to meet you and talk to your audience today. Yes. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe so we can uh, keep you up to date on future episodes. And thanks again for joining us for this episode. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.